Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ascend Fireside Chat with Rinky Sethi. I'm Shivani. I am the CEO and founder of Ascend. We offer a six-week online leadership program to help women move into management. And what inspired me to start Ascend was I used to be in our members' shoes. I used to be on your side of the table. So I led and owned different products and business initiatives at large companies like PayPal and high growth startups. And as I was moving up into my first manager role, I learned how to get buy-in and motivate my, my teams by honestly making a lot of mistakes, some guidance, but primarily a lot of mistakes. And so I set out to create the leadership program that I wish I had access to when I was making that transition. And now with the Sense Leadership Program, we've had women who've gone through the program from companies like Google, Facebook, Slack, Twitter, Peloton, and many more companies and coming out feeling much more confident, being able to get buy-in from stakeholders, including dominant personalities, and growing in their careers, even getting promoted, which has been really amazing. And so much of the conversation in the program curriculum is curated by senior leaders who have been in your shoes. I think we need to have open and honest conversations around what it takes to be successful at work. And that's why we host these fireside chats. So we get to learn from successful, inspiring women and learn the real challenges and how to actually tackle them in the workplace. I am so excited today to be here with Rinky. Rinky is a chief information security officer at Twitter. And before that, she held, she held many leadership roles at companies like IBM, eBay, Rubrik, She's someone, she didn't know this, but she's someone that um, has been a role model from afar for many, many years. And so Rinky, I'm truly honored to be here with you. I'm a big fan. I love how you've navigated your career and like so well balanced and so thoughtful and inspiring. So I'm really excited to dive in today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's an honor to be uh, here with you, Shivani. Thanks. And so today Rinky and I are going to chat for about 40 minutes and then we're going to take questions from you. So you can add questions at any time using the Q&A icon that is at the bottom right of your screen. And you can add and upload questions, ask anything that you'd like. We're here to have an open and honest conversation to really help you and make it valuable for you. With that, let's dive in, Rinky. And so you have had a very impressive career and continue to do so. What are the inflection points in your life that has helped shape who you are as a leader or what has helped you um, impact your career trajectory? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think the biggest inflection point, um, in my career, I would say, and of course we can talk about life maybe a little bit later is, um, you know, I was really junior. I was a security engineer at walmart.com and I was also a new mother. I had my first daughter at work and uh, while I was working there. And I remember coming back to work. I did the really short maternity leave um, back then. Um, and I went back, I went back to work and I talked to my leader and I uh, shared with him that, yeah, I need to take some time off from like I need, I need to work from home once a week, if that's okay with you. I need to just have that breathing room because I had an 80 mile round commute. And at the time, and the answer was a flat no from the leader and it was like, nope, sorry, because if I let you do it, I'm going to have to let everybody do it. And I realized in that moment that I don't think I could be a working mom and that like being a mo mother was the number one priority for me and that I was going to leave. And I talked to my husband about it and he said, I support whatever decisions you want to make. And I slept on it for a few days and there was something in, inside me that was just like a fire burning because I knew that my leader wasn't bad. I just knew that he didn't get it and that the policies weren't supporting parents in the right way at that workplace. And I felt like, okay, I'm, before I leave, I need to drive a change for others here too. And like for people like me. And I went and worked with the HR organization to develop the first work from home policy there. And that for me was a whole change in my life, my career, the way I saw it at that point. Cause after we established that, I was like, I'm not leaving the workplace. I need to make things better for other people. I need to help drive change in this world. And I want to continue doing that. Um, and so I want to continue working. And so I wouldn't be here today if that moment hadn't happened. Um, and so I'm grateful for that experience. And that I think was a major inflection point in my career and kind of gave me this kind of larger mission um, in, in my career that I needed to go and solve for constantly. Oh, I love that. I love that you, you know, didn't just take focus on yourself, but also focus on like, how do I create that change for others? And it especially resonates with me because 
a big reason why I started Ascend was because I want to elevate more women into leadership. I think that is a big way that we see the change that we need to see in today's workplaces. And it, this makes me even more excited for our conversation because we have this shared passion and you help drive this really meaningful change when it was very easy for you to sleep. And so thank you for sharing that. And I think that really speaks to who you are as a leader. And so I'd love to dive into how your team would describe you as a leader. In a sense, leadership program, we spend a lot of time thinking about what is our brand at work? What do we want our reputation to be? So what are the adjectives that your team would use to describe you as a leader? Yeah, I, I, you know, I ask my team for feedback all the time. Um, and so I can tell you what they say. <laughs> One is uh, extremely empathetic, um, you know, and almost uh, borderline sympathetic at times. And so that's, uh, you know, one thing that I have, I do care about people um, a lot. And I care about, you know, supporting people's careers. So empathetic is a big one. Uh, the other one is I'm very direct. And I feel like, um, I've made my biggest mistakes because of that. And I've also had my biggest accomplishments because of that. Um, I've learned that you can't uh, have dead bodies if you wanna be successful. So you can't, your directness has to be tailored to a certain extent, um, but I'm incredibly direct in giving others feedback, um, you know, and just putting my views on the table the way that I feel them. So I think those are the two biggest traits you'll hear from people uh, that surround me. I love those. And that is a really great, I think I'd love to dive in a little bit more on that. So in the leadership program, I often hear from the women in the program is how do I balance being nice versus direct? And, you know, I often talk about like those two aren't actually in conflict with each other. And you brought up two great traits, so empathetic and direct. And I think some of the people in the program or some of the women out there listening or just people in general would view those as conflicting. So how do you decide when to be direct and balance that with being empathetic? I don't think it is a balance. I think it's, they're not in, I don't even see the, that I have to weigh the two. The one thing I do do is if you're going to give somebody feedback or you're going to be direct with somebody, you have to put yourself in their shoes, right? So if I'm going to say something like, how are they going to react? Because what's my intent at the end of the day? It's not to hurt anybody's feelings. It's to hopefully have some behavior change or hoping that that person is more successful or hoping they stop do they don't do something that they're currently doing that's um, holding them back in some way or something that they, they're doing that might be hurtful. And so if you want to drive a change in that individual, the way you give your feedback, you have to put yourself in the listener's shoes. And I think that empath empathy is what is like the baseline of being direct. And I think it's when you don't do that. And many times you give feedback right in the moment, you're not thoughtful about how you frame it. And that's when you can leave the dead bodies that I mentioned. And so I think it's important if you want your feedback to be listened to, I think it's really important that you start from putting yourself in the other person's shoes and how you're gonna deliver the feedback. Cause that's the only way that change will, you know, otherwise it's gonna be feedback in one year out the other. Yeah, I love how you explain that and how you approach that. For me, I like similar to you, most of my mistakes have been around like being too direct. I come in, give someone feedback, I'm like, this didn't work. And they just don't even hear the feedback because they're just like defensive. And it's only when you're empathetic, you can actually position in a way that you're actually helping the person grow. Because I know I've been guilty of so many times just focusing on like what I want to say instead of actually reminding myself, okay, how am I actually trying to help this person? How am I actually helping the team move forward? I want to like now, as we're talking about like helping the team move forward, I'd love to hear, how do you think about motivating and inspiring your teams? What are one to two actions you do to really motivate your teams, especially now in a remote environment where it is much harder to build that connection? Yeah, I mean, people are people. I think one thing is understanding folks, um, you know, there's like such a human component and I can tell you, I, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting question because I've had to relearn this myself. Um, when I joined Twitter, I interviewed hundred percent remote. I met my, I haven't met anybody uh, on the team yet. So it's just, I've been leading from afar and it, you have to build relationships with people. You have to understand people at that human level. And I think you can't inspire, you can't lead, you can't motivate people unless you understand what motivates them first. So I think the first thing is like really connecting with people. The other is, I think it's really important to build a strategy that folks understand that then, you know, they feel like that's what I want to go follow and it's inspirational. And so I think having a really mindset 
is um, also very, very important. And, and you know, I just think um, people have to see that, hey, I, I wanna grow my careers in this place. I understand the strategy. I wanna execute on it. Um, I feel like she's, you know, she or he or whoever the leader might be, that's somebody that I wanna work for because I can see bigger things here. And so I think you have to build that. It's not easy. And in this remote world, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, but, you know, I also like, I think it's really important. I make, you know, you don't have these hallway conversations with people to connect with. And I think you have to make the time one-on-one, -on -one, understand what, where the problem areas might be. And so I think it goes all again, back to that connection with people. Yeah. How do you do that connection in that remote world? Are you doing one-on-ones more regularly with people or what does that look like for y'all? Yeah, I've gotten, um, so one-on-ones, those are scheduled and then those are sometimes more agenda driven, but I like, it's harder to le read body language over Zoom because you can't tell if someone's like irritated, either making a face because they're irritated at something someone said, or if a cat just jumped on their lap or a kid just ran by, like you can't read it the same way you do in a meeting room. And I've been, I've gotten a lot better at, hey, I'm just going to send that person a Slack and say, look like something bothered you in that meeting. Is everything good? Um, let's just jump on a quick meeting right now and like chat for a few minutes and just connect. So that's kind of how I do my hallway conversations now um, with folks um, and just kind of jump on. Um, I also try to, again, like, hey, I want to, you know, you have to connect with people because it's like I heard, you know, heard the other day that a team member of mine was uh, in an accident. And so just jumping on and saying like, hey, is everything okay? Checking in. It's, it's much harder because you're not seeing the individuals anymore. So I think you have to find creative ways to connect. And then I, we do some fun virtual things too. Like we made Vietnamese coffee together as an organization and just trying to keep it as fun and as, you know, as connected as you can in this world and um, making sure folks feel connected and feel like they're cared about. I love that. I know sometimes it feels like I need to have 30 minutes of content to schedule a meeting. And I like that you're just making it okay that, hey, we can chat for a couple minutes. Let's just get on the phone. It doesn't need to be this like full thought out thing. And that helps somewhat replace the hallway conversations, not completely, but helps like have those short conversations more easily. You know, as we um, are talking more about like motivating teams and kind of like being a leader, I know a big topic is around, a big struggle for many of us is around working with difficult stakeholders. In a sense leadership program, we spend a full week talking about how do you respond back to dominant personalities. And I imagine you've had to face a challenge many times at work and so I'd love to hear what are one to two strategies that you use to work with difficult stakeholders? Yeah, one is one that's helped me and continues to help me is build allies. Because <laughs> um, it's, you know, it, unless you feel comfortable stepping up and st sitting there and saying, you know, here's just, you know, stopping the difficult stakeholder and really digging into why it is that they're articulating things the way they are. Um, I think if you're not comfortable with it, um, build allies, have allies there with you that can have your back when you might not. And um, so the, again, it goes back to, it's all about relationships and having those allies, them understanding. Um, but even with difficult stakeholders, they're coming from a viewpoint for a reason. And I think a lot of times in the moment, conversations get heated and each party wants to win their side of it. And I think really breaking down what's at the bottom of it. So it's like, hey, I hear you let's break that down. Like, where are you coming from? And I think it's important to like, take some steps back to understand why are they being difficult? Because there might be something there, either there's some history on why they've landed in the position, uh, like the position that they're taking in that moment. So I think there's a lot you can do to unpack, ask questions. I think there's a book, right? Start with why and why and like, so why, why are you taking that stance? And then there'll be a reason. Okay, why is that the case? And you can unpack some of the things as to why someone's being difficult. And then maybe it's not, they're no longer difficult anymore because now they understand that you understand where they're coming from. Yeah, that's great. I've also found that oftentimes when people are being difficult, either they don't realize it or, and, or it's not about you. It's not personal. It's something else, maybe in their personal life or something at work that's stressing them out, or they are feeling pressure to hit a certain target at work. And they really need this one idea that they're trying to pitch go through. And it's not even about you. And so coming from a place of curiosity and also recognizing that it's not about you for me and like for so many of our members has helped just make us feel more peaceful in that moment and just feel like, feel more calm and collected. How do you build allies around this? So are you going to people and being like, can you help me like support this idea? Or like, what does that look like, the allyship 
building process. Yeah, you can't, I, I think when you, I think it's really superficial if you try to build allies when you're actually like fighting for your cause. I think it's important to build relationships with people, understand, um, you know, people that you like really connect with well that where you you see like, oh, this person is um, really supporting me on the sidelines and has my back on every meeting that I go to. They've got my back. They understand where I'm coming from. And that happens over time. It doesn't happen like, hey, I'm going to go seek out support from people ahead of time and then go into meeting. And that because that only is for one idea and one meeting. And it's really short sighted when you try to build allies on a certain thing you're trying to do. But when you do that, like when you're building your relationships, it's it's crazy because you might be in a meeting with in a difficult situation, and you'll be surprised by who might speak up because you know you're in a and because it's an allyship that you've built over time. I don't think it hurts if you're you are kind of um, you know trying to move the needle on a difficult thing, and that you have difficult stakeholders. It doesn't hurt to go and run that by people ahead of time, and even run it by your difficult uh, stakeholder ahead of time to say, let's chat about this privately before we get into a larger meeting where you might be steamrolled. And so I think that's really important too, is you know making sure that it's whatever idea you have or whatever it is, is well vetted ahead of time as well. Yeah, that's my favorite move too, doing one-on-one beforehand. I, I always, like to know the outcome of the meeting before I go into the meeting. And so doing one-on-ones, getting people aligned. And it's such a, it's a safer space for people. It disarms people to actually openly discuss what are their concerns. Whereas in a group meeting, it can just create additional pressure to like stick to what you're saying or people are coming. It just, it's not as productive. So that makes a ton of sense. Now, you know, as we were talking about, like you've had a really great career. I'd love to hear, how do you think about advocating for yourself? Like what is, maybe it's sponsors, maybe it's something else. Like what is something that you found to be the most helpful as you advocated for yourself and really showed the value that you're bringing at work? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I advocate, like it's, I have advocated for myself. I've also developed my own brand and I'm really proud of it. And, um, you know, you do that. It doesn't just happen. You do that over time and it happens in different ways. It's not about, you know, a lot of people think that brand development and advocacy is about you saying, Hey, look what I did. I worked on this project and it's super shiny and it's pretty and like everybody should like it and taking credit for it. And that's not what it is. Um, to me, a lot of that is around thought leadership. It's putting, it's really taking a risk in terms of I feel a certain way about something and putting that out there and you start developing a brand and you start advocating for something that you believe in and all of a sudden there's a lot of others that are advocating for that thing and you might start becoming a leader for that thing right whatever it might be for me like girls in cyber and uh, more girls getting into cybersecurity and that kind of thing is super important and I've talked about it and I keep talking about it. I talk about women in tech and how do we get more women in and you know you see all these people that also believe in the same things and you're all of a sudden they're they're your advocates and they're your champions um you know and and that happens at work too it's about the thing right it's the second you start making it about just yourself i think that's where you lose folks along the way um and people think oh there she comes or there he comes just advocating for themselves again um and but you know you do need to ask for what you want i think so it's not i'm not suggesting that you have you you just trust that others are going to advocate for what you want i do think you have to go ask for what you want and i think it's taking risks yeah i love that and how do you it, especially because i often what i hear from people is like i'm afraid to show what i'm bringing to the table it's because i don't want to be seen as showing off and bragging but one thing i always say is like well focus on the impact of the company it's never about you like you said like you don't want to be that person where people are like, oh, well, here she is again, like touting herself. And so focusing more on like, what do you, like, how does it help the company, the, the ideas? And, you know, the other thing you just touched upon is like asking for what you want. Any advice in there, anything that you would recommend? Like, for example, like I have asked for every single promotion and pay raise that I've gotten. And when I go to my manager and ask for that, they're usually like, yeah, that makes sense. Let's go do it. And it wasn't that they were being malicious. It's just that they were busy and they weren't connecting the dots. And, and sometimes they don't even know that you want something unless you actually ask for it. So some, and is there anything that's worked for you around, you know, asking for what you want? Yeah. I just, you ask for it. And I think it's really hard. It's you're putting yourself out there. And I think like, I know I've struggled with it because you debate in your head, what if this happens? And what if they say no? And what if they, you know, embarrass me? And there's all these things, right? And so 
I, I feel like I, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. Um, in a former uh, role, I went and asked my boss for not, it wasn't even for a promotion. It was to step into a different responsibility and role. It was a larger role. Um, and he, he just came back and I, it took me a lot of guts to even ask. And he came back and said, no, you're not ready yet. And I had to take that. And I felt like I wanted to go hide under a rock. And for a week, I was so angry and embarrassed and upset that like, how am I even going to face him again? Because like, now I know where I stand in his like, uh, you know, eyes. And so I, but then later I came back and I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go show that I like, I'm totally capable of it. And I did. And later, like, fortunately the timing was right and he recognized it and I got promoted into that role. Um, and I think that you have to be prepared for what's going to come and it takes some guts, but you like the only way to ask for what you want is ask for you what you want and just go and do it and be prepared for a yes, no, maybe. Yeah, for sure. And I always, you know, at least for my life principle is you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And so always ask, if you got to know, then figure out next steps. So similar to like, you got to know and you're like, well, I'm going to go figure out how to make this happen. And then it ended up in a good outcome. But if you hadn't asked, then you probably would not have been clear on what it required for you to get that promotion or for you to take on that larger scope. Yeah, the one the one point I want to make though, um, Shivani, and I see like a lot of people struggle with this is they get stuck when they get when they get told no, they get stuck and mm -hmm. they get fixated on the fact that it was a no and they get fixated on that promotion. Um, and you know, I think it's an opportunity at that point when there is a no to find out like, why is it a no? And what can you work on? And if it is, sometimes it's not a reasonable answer that leader may give. And sometimes it is, and you really can grow during that time. Um, and I, that's when the stretches happen and you realize, okay, there's things I need to do better, not to get fixated on the no and not to get fixated on, you know, a, a promotion. Cause there's more to it than that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you made a really good call out. Like sometimes the leader, will give you a no and not give you a clear answer on why or how to move forward. How do you recommend handling that situation? Yeah, I think at that point, it's, if there's not a clear answer, it's checking in with like, you know, there's a lot of things you can do, get feedback from others, do it in a 360 way, ask your leader, like, it's still not clear to me. I would like, could you initiate a feedback, like a 360 feedback where you interview those that report to me, those that are, you know, peers of mine, other stakeholders, and I'd love to get feedback. And it's great to get kind of rounded feedback anyway, and it'll give you some insight. Um, and then if you're, if, you know, sometimes you have that instinct that this is just not right, you know, you have, that's a decision you have to make. I think a lot of folks, they get are like, I don't, you know, they don't realize you're not, you don't have handcuffs on, you can go and leave, look for a different role. And sometimes that's a good thing. I have changed roles um, almost every three years or so. And it's been really good for me from a growth perspective, from a career perspective, from like an upwards mobility perspective, just learning different industries. So you have to ask yourself that. Yeah, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, not being afraid of maybe a job change is the one required and that can lead to so much more growth. So it, not feeling shut in because I think often when we get that no we just feel like cut in a corner and it's, that's not actually the case for, mo for most people for most situations you're not actually in that corner you know I'm really loving our discussion I'm loving these honest conversations let's talk about failures I think that's something that we often don't talk about but in reality you know while we celebrate successes there's so many failures behind every single success and I think we would be much better off if we started talking about mistakes and normalizing mistakes because that is just part of the journey. And so can you share what's a failure that you've had in your career and what have you learned from it? And right before you do that, um, for anybody, if you have questions, just throw them in the Q&A and um, then we can start taking questions from all of you also. So what's a failure that you've had in your career and what have you learned from it? Yeah, gosh. Um let's see, let's pick one, you know, I um, had to launch a pretty large global program at uh, one of the companies that I was at. Um, and the program was to build, like, when you try to do security, and you want engineers and everybody to adopt security, you can't just drive it from a central security organization. Sometimes you have to build champions within different orgs that will dotted line into security. And I had this grand plan of that's what I was going to go build. We spent a lot of time getting a knowledge based system, like a, you know, a learning management system that where we built all this training for the champions. Um, and we trained the champ, we got a group of champions trained through it. And 
launched it. We made global noise around the whole thing. And about six months later, the momentum was completely gone. And it was because we didn't, from the beginning, we didn't build in like, how are we going to sustain this? How are we going to show success from this program? It was all about getting them trained, calling them champions and launching this program. And soon we saw that we were missing pieces. And at that point, we were then playing like catch up because now you have all these champions that have been trained up that are excited to go move forward, but they don't know what to do next and they're waiting for direction. Um, and so the big failure, I have to go and talk through that. And it's like champions is now like pretty well established concept in the industry at that time it wasn't. Um, and so I remember we had to just relaunch the whole thing, talk about the learnings that we had built in that curriculum, take our time before launch. Um, and to me, it was, you know, when you're especially earlier in your career, you want to hit the ground running and get some wins in. And, and you don't always have that strategic vision or that bigger picture and that long-term strategy. And so for me, that was a big learning that you've got to have a long-term view on things. Otherwise, you're, you know, if it's short-term, it's going to be so short-lived. Um, and so you want to kind of have that long-term view and make sure that you've got good buy-in um, across the board on that long-term view. And then you, you're really set up for success. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think it's so easy to start thinking short-term and be like, what is how does my team win in the near term? But to get people more, to get people really on board and for you to also be seen as a senior experienced leader is thinking about that, that long term. And you know, as you're bringing up these, like getting the champions and kind of driving alignment, one thing that comes to mind is like, how do you prepare to have these conversations? So we often talk about in the leadership program, are like, what does preparation look like? And, you know, one question I frequently get is like, I'm so busy. I have like so many meetings going on. Like, how do I find time to prepare? And so how do you carve that out? Because I know you're really busy too. You're working, you have kids, you have a really full life. You mean, how do you prepare is the question, Shivani, like, like, how do I yeah. prepare? How do you prepare for like meetings going in, thinking about like, how do you strategically think about like, carve out the time to think about how to get buy-in from people. Uh, yeah, so preparing for all these conversations. Yeah, um, for me, I it depends on the meeting, right? Some meetings you don't have to prepare for. You can just go in and you can have a casual conversation. And I think less prep sometimes is even better because you're connecting with the individual. You're trying to understand like, hey, here's what I'm trying to drive, but I'd love to just get your feedback um, in how we're developing that. And that's always worked really well for me in terms of going in and asking for feedback rather than saying, here's what we're gonna go do, go buy into this. Um, and I think that works really well. Um, but, but there's some meetings you prepare a lot for. Like I had a board meeting yesterday and I was like, I, I did a lot of prep work for it. I ran it by people that I trust to say, ask me questions, ask me the most difficult questions you think might come my way. Um, and I'll do extra prep. So it depends on the meeting that you're uh, going into. And I think, um, especially in, it's really hard to prep for every single meeting. I think it's okay to say that, hey, like I've sent you a bunch of prep material. I don't even know if you've had time to review it. Do you want to just take the first 10, 15 minutes so that we can all get aligned and just read? And that's one thing that's been really cool about Twitter that they do realize that we spend the first time, sometimes 10, 15 minutes just reviewing documents in the meeting. And then we'll have a conversation around the questions that people have. Um, and so I think it's, uh, again, goes back to yes, prep, think about like what you're asking for. Sometimes if you have an idea, getting feedback from others is the best way to kick off a meeting and it gets a really good dialogue going. Um, but, and, and for really important meetings, do prepare, spend your evenings, do what you got to do to prepare and kind of balance that in the way that's possible for you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I've probably spent hours preparing for like board meetings or even if it's a 15 minute conversation, um, if it's really high stakes, then it's totally worth it because I'd rather just be in that room, be able to answer everyone's questions, be really articulate, then and then walk out of the meeting feeling like, oh, that went really well, then regret that later. Like to me, that's totally worth the investment of time up front. Can agree more. Yeah. How? So I see we have a lot of great questions in the chat and in the Q and A. And one of the questions is around getting buy-in, especially when priorities such as roadmaps are constantly changing based on people's like decisions are being made more on people's like immediate reactions or thoughts rather than sounds like more kind of like thought out or kind of like like more like thought out processes. So. How would you, how do you handle situations when decisions are being made more on the fly? Like, so you've agreed on something and then a week later an executive comes in or someone else comes in and they're like, we're just going to change it. And it's more an immediate reaction. How do you, and your team's already started working on it. Like, how do you navigate that? Um, change is constant. <laughs> so I think like there's two things that I feel um, about that in teams 
really struggle with change. And so if it's, if you feel that it's the right change that yes, you have to take that step back in, in the moment and say, is the company changing direction? Are we moving, reprioritizing because of that? And if you are, then you better get on board and say like, we want it because otherwise you're left behind and that's not where you want to be. And so you really have to take that. Now, if you really feel like on the fly that the executive that's making that decision and saying, let's move in a different direction might be missing some context and it's not the right call. It's good to say, let's pause for a minute. Like, I totally understand that we need to change direction. There's something new coming, but can we just let's get some context on the table and go back. Cause just last week we decided this was going to be a priority. Here's the work that's been done on it. Um, and I don't think we should drop this and this is why. And you'll be surprised in that moment that many executives will be like, oh, I didn't know that you're right. Um, and then there's other moments where they might school you and say like, I understand that we just need to put a pause on that. It's not number one thing and we need to change and you have to then embrace that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I found in the moments when I've done exactly what you're talking about, and come in like really prepared and like respectful of them. So being like, you know, maybe this is the right, like I'm not saying it's not the right decision, but I just want to flag. And here's like what we know up to date. I've actually found even when the moments when they still say no, and they're like, we're going to move forward with what I just made a decision on their respect for me increases. Cause it's just like coming in like, cause you're not afraid of like speaking up and you're coming in with really thoughtful reasons. You're not wasting anyone's time. No, and you're keeping that individual better informed too, right? So it's like they're getting, okay, like I've got, I feel like I have all the data now to make a good effective decision. And that's always a good thing. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that takes a lot of courage to do. And, you know, you, you were a really earlier sharing, like how your team has described you as empathetic and direct. And one question I see in the chat is around, how do you build trust with your direct team that they feel comfortable giving you feedback? And, you know, it sounds like you have a really great relationship with your team. So we'd love to learn how you've done that. And we also talked about how you connect with your team. Is there anything else that you would add and how you've been able to build trust with your team that they feel comfortable giving you feedback, especially when it's not easy feedback to give? Yeah, I mean, one is I give feedback and I talk through things with people and I do put myself in their shoes. And I don't, you know, giving feedback, I like know how difficult it is to get, it's really easy to give good feedback. When it's critical feedback, it's very hard for a leader to do that. And most leaders don't do it. They're not invested enough or they like, you have to be invested in somebody to care or to give them feedback. And then you have to be really thoughtful with the way you talk about that feedback. So I do it, I do it all the time and I showcase it and I ask for feedback. So I go back and ask for feedback and folks have given me difficult feedback and I don't retaliate. I take it graciously. And I tell them that, you know, I really appreciate it. I need to process on that. And I'm going to, I like, we'll come back and we'll talk about it a little bit more if I'm not ready to talk about it in the moment. Um, and that's what builds trust. It builds trust when you receive feedback, they don't see any kind of retaliation. They see that there's change happening as a result of their feedback. That doesn't just build trust. It builds loyalty. It builds like respect for an individual. And it's all of those things. So I think feedback's one way to build trust. I think the other thing is also just understanding where people, it goes back to we're all humans at the end of the day, like knowing that someone is like cares about you, like, you know, you spend just the first five minutes saying like, how are things with you? And like, just making it human, I think is a really important thing. Being vulnerable myself. Uh, I do a lot of journey lines um, as team bonding exercises. And I share some really deep secrets that many people don't know about me. And I put myself out there and they know that. And it, it allows them to open up in the same way as well. I love that. I used to think that vulnerability was a weakness and I had to come across as really buttoned up. But I actually found that the moment I started being vulnerable with my team, sharing like, I'm anxious too, I'm stressed about this too. It really changed the conversation and it, and also made it more fun because I didn't feel like I had to have this shield in front that I have like this other armor. And like you said, being vulnerable myself set the right stage and set the right example for my team to be more vulnerable. And how do you, you know, so you have vulnerability. I think especially as women, sometimes it can be hard to be vulnerable in the workplace or there can be biases that if you are vulnerable, you're seen as weak, even though that's not necessarily true. And I see a question in the chat around, you know, being a woman in a team of many men and kind of like building up your credibility in that standpoint. So how do you balance like any tips you would have for the group around, you know, establishing your credibility, um, but still being and uh, while being authentic to yourself, not saying that those two are in conflict. So how do you think about that? 
I think you be you, right? I think be authentic. And it's not about whether you're around men or women or, you know, it's not about the gender. It's about like you being you and you being authentic. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I, I, I shared that leaders sometimes make calls or people make calls, not because they're bad people, but because they don't understand. And I think it's important if you have a different viewpoint or you're a different kind of person that you voice your opinions or you share feedback that makes it comfortable for you to be authentic. And I think that we owe ourselves that and we owe others that too, that it's an education along the way. It was like that work from home story that I told you about earlier that like, it wasn't that the leader didn't, un it wasn't that he was a mean person, he didn't get it. And so like, how do you make, what do you do to change the workplace to be a better place then for everybody? And I think um, that's what comes to mind for me is, you know, that's how you build the courage to go and like be yourself. I think don't worry about whether it's like a, you know, I, I don't now go into rooms and worry about, is it a room full of all men or all women? And um, I just go in as myself. And um, if there, if there's retaliation for being authentic, then, you know, that needs to be worked on for sure. And that needs to be called out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you just touched upon that, the story from Walmart. And we have a question in the chat around balancing work and personal life as a working mom you know you have a very senior role and you have two kids and you're actually involved in many other things and so how do you manage it all like any any advice for the group um about how you there's only a fixed amount of time of the day so how do you able how are you able to like excel at all of this yeah i like I just, it's funny, like the ba word balance for me has gone into the garbage. I feel like it's its all about feeling good about the decisions that you make. Um, and, you know, uh, I know Shivani, you and I have talked about this before, but like, don't feel guilty for the decisions you have to make. And there's enough other people that are going to make you feel that way for one reason or another. Don't do it to yourself. And so I know... Um, I would go to school to, I'm, I'm a working mom. I've made decisions to not go to some dance performance or singing performance because of an opportunity at work. Um, and I felt like that was the right thing for me. And that was the right thing for my family and the right thing for my career. I've also made the opposite decisions where I didn't go to a happy hour where I knew that there might be some interesting things talked about because I felt like it was more important to go to a back to school night or whatever it might be. And I made that decision and I felt really good about it. And I didn't feel, and there, there's a little bit of compromise that goes into it, but that's how I see it is like, make your decision, feel really good about it. Don't let others make you feel guilty about it. Like I don't even, sometimes my kids now know never to say something that would like even try to guilt trip me. It's not going to work. Um, and you know, you go to school and there's working moms that feel like, oh, she has a nanny for her kids and she's not, I mean, there's moms that don't work and they feel, they feel like, oh, she's got a nanny. She's not really there for their kids. There's a lot of people that will make you feel guilty for the choices you make. I can tell you, I feel damn good about the choices I've made. I feel good about who I am to my kids. The fact that I work makes me a better mom. I I think and that's my call and that's who I am um and so and I don't feel I don't feel any guilt about anything that's to that I love it that was great <laughs> I know for um yeah and we talked about like as I start like as my husband and I start thinking about having kids and that's definitely something on my mind like balance and and you're right like it's not balance and you know as I like really want to make a sense like continue to grow it it's been amazing and continue to help more women move into leadership and at the same time having a family. And I agree with you. I don't necessarily see it as conflict. I actually think so much of how I grow in my work life impacts like who I am in my personal life and setting a role model for my children around like what that can look like and, and also others, which I think is really fulfilling, at least in my opinion. I think that's really fulfilling. How, um, this has been really amazing. Any advice, like any piece of like career advice you'd give to the group as, you know, kind of like biggest learnings that you've had as you've grown your career or as you, I know you mentor a lot of people. So like, what's one piece of career advice that you would give to the group? I would say take really big risks early on. Um, I like where you started with this conversation, Shivani, around making mistakes. Um, you know, I remember being one of like, first of all, like graduating college at a really bad time entering the cybersecurity um, industry, an industry where you didn't see any woman, barely any woman. Um, and I felt like I had to be perfect at everything. And when you feel like that, you don't take risks um, and you don't make mistakes. And that's I, what I've learned is that 
the earlier you make mistakes, the earlier you take risks, whatever that risk might be, little or big, um, that's when you start learning. And it's the mistakes and the risks I've taken that I've learned the most from that I think have brought me the most success in my career. It's not necessarily the wins, right? The wins come from the misses you've had. And so um, I think that you just like take risks and it's it's a proven thing that women tend not to take risks right it's like when you look at if a woman thinks that they're not qualified for a role they probably won't apply whereas men they'll be like i'm a shoe in even if they're not qualified um and so i think just think keeping that data in mind like just go for it make mistakes break things i think that's when you learn and you grow the most that's great i also have benefited the most from my mistakes i mean i started to send because of all the mistakes i made at work and i was like wait, other people don't need to have all these blowups to try to get by in and work better with people. And so that really resonates with me. And, you know, how do you, speaking of those risks, like how do you take calculated risks? Like when do you kind of figure out or when you are taking a risk? Like, for example, like I often, when I'm taking a risk, I often think about like, well, what's the worst case scenario? And when I actually force myself to think about it, it's actually not as bad as if I had just like gone into a black hole in my mind around it. Are there other things that you do or you think about to give you more comfort around the risk that you take? Yeah, I've learned that I talk, like I have a pretty good, like I've created good pe like, people that I really trust around me, whether that's my family member or my sister or whoever it might be. And I'm like, I'm gonna go do this, you know? Um, what do you think? And we'll talk about it and it's like, well, that sounds dumb or that sounds good. Like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about it? And I talk, I talk about it with peers of mine that I trust too, if it's a project or something like that, where I'm like, I'm gonna go and test this even, I'm gonna take this a step further. And they'll give me all the things that I didn't think about already. Cause calculated risk is not about the data that you just already have or know. It's about also gathering all the other data points that might exist and getting other viewpoints in, and it helps you take um, better risks Having said that, you still might make a mistake. You still might fail, and that's okay. Um, but that's what I, that's what I feel like. And I think you have to work in an environment that fosters that kind of culture too. Um, you don't want to be fired necessarily because you took a calculated risk um, and you've learned from it. So I think you've got to surround yourself with people that um, will value that. I love that. Yeah, having that board of advisors just like bounce off ideas. I know for me, I get so I can get so caught up in my own head. So just having someone to like pull me out of it and sharing new information or just helping me like think through it is super helpful. This has been really insightful. And I love Ricky. I like just love how you're like just honestly sharing all these learnings and all these mistakes that you shared. Thank you so much. You know, let's like, I love it. Like we have so many key takeaways. Drop in the chat. What is one of your key takeaways or like the thing that really stuck out to you from what Ricky said? And let's just like take it. I know for me right now, we've said like the misses power the wins. And really around that like direct versus empathy, it's, they're not conflicting with each other. They are actually going into each other. And so, um, yeah, drop in the chat, like what's your favorite like learning from this conversation or a piece of advice that you wanna walk away with? 91% time you can be 50% of your own blocker. Love that, yeah. Take risks. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, that's awesome. There's enough people in the world that can make you feel guilty for your choices. Don't do it yourself. The quicker you fail, the better you'll be at taking risks and growing. These are all so good. Own your decisions. Be authentic. These are really amazing. Ricky, thank you again. Thank you to everyone for joining. I love the energy. I love all your questions. This was a really amazing discussion. Oh, I feel damn good about my choices. Nice. And you know, if you found today's conversation really helpful and you wanna spend a few weeks developing the habits around a lot of topics we talked about, motivating teams, becoming a better leader, growing your brand at work, responding, pushing back against dominant personalities, feeling more confident, then I'd love to work with you in a Send Leadership program. The program starts in the middle of June. We currently have a wait list. And so Lilia will drop the link in the chat if you wanna add yourself to the wait list and you'll be in cohorts with just incredible women. The community is my favorite part of the program. It's high caliber, but low ego. So if you wanna learn more and join the wait list to join the upcoming cohort, go ahead and drop your name um, on our wait list. And thank you again. We will share the recording with you after this. And so you can go back and rewatch all this good advice that Ricky shared. And Ricky, thank you again for joining. This was truly just an amazing conversation. Thank you for having me, Shivani. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and take care. Bye.